right. This is Chris Keys for From Your Guitar. Today I am joined by Kurt Ballou, the incomparable Kurt Ballou of Converge and God City Instruments and God City Recording oh. Studio. How Thank you, you doing, Kurt? For, uh, thanks a lot for having me. I'm doing well. Yeah. Having fun on tour with, uh, with Brutus and Frail Body here. Um, it's awesome. And um, yeah, it's been a little while since we've been to Nashville, so we're really looking forward to playing tonight. Yeah, and we did one over the internet, uh, so go check that one out in 2021, but I'm glad that we're able to do this in person and uh, get down yeah. and dirty and talk gear. Let's start with this blue, uh, sparkly, Ooh, yeah. beautiful guitar. This is a um, God City Instruments Constructivist, uh, which is my own brand, and this is actually, um, this shape has been around for about 12 years or so, but um, I recently did like a nice big run of them. Um, they're actually in stock right now at Chicago Music Exchange if you want to get one of your own. Just kind of unheard of because um, typically they sell pre-order style. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this one is um, an alder body, a uh, toasted maple neck, um, um, a f rosewood? No, ebony, ebony board. Sorry, I forgot what board it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, it's got binding on the on the fretboard. The pickups are the GCI soap jammers, which look like P90s, but are actually um, stacked humbuckers. Super high and output, right? Super high output. They still have like kind of like the mid-range push of a P90, but they're more like um, they're definitely more humbucker flavored. And I use them for chugga 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 stuff interchangeably <laughs> with other humbucker pickups, although these are like a little more mid-rangey. I don't have this guitar set up to do a coil split, but if I were to, like the P90 operation is almost as hot, but has more sparkle and a little more noise than the, the, the stacked humbucker option. For the people that do know uh, the GCI stuff, how does that sit with like the log jammer and the, the slug jammer in terms of like sound and the They're probably magnets. about the same output, maybe a little okay. stronger output than the log jammer, which is like a dual blade pickup. That one is is my most sparkly pickup. Um, and then the slug jammer is the hottest of the bunch and it's a very um, full range humbucker with, uh, with uh, 12 oversize slugs per, per humbucker. And uh, we can, I'll bring out the Craftsman guitar later. I have uh, the, the slug jammer in that. You'll be able to hear the difference. Now, uh, I think other specs that you do because on your instruments, because they, their preference for you are the scale length and the nut width, right? Just for playing um, comfortability? You know, scale length for me, um, most of my stuff is 25 and a half, like Fender scale. Although the deconstructivist model that I don't have with me here is 24 and three quarter. And uh, I haven't talked about this publicly yet, but I'm working on a deconstructivist um, baritone Ooh. that's going to be, I think, 27 and a half, nice. um, if I recall. Um, and uh, I also do bases of medium scale and long scale. Uh, but yeah, for me, 25 and a half feels good, especially we tend to tune like D standard or lower. So having that extra scale length adds a little bit of tension to the, to the strings and um, works for, for my tuning well. I personally like an inch and three quarter wide nut because I have giant hands, <laughs> but I, most people don't love like a nut width that, that wide. So I've, I've chosen um, inch and 11 sixteenths for most of the models. Okay. Um, I find that's pretty universal. Um, like I want something to be my taste, but I don't, want, don't also want it to be so specific that it's not um, comfortable for other players as well. Now, what do we know specifically about the strings? Do you have a preferred brand or yes, loyalty Yes, I do. Thing? So I've been with the Dario for quite a long time, about 20 years, and I've been using the NYXLs since NYXL came out. Um, at the moment, I'm using, I forget the, the model number, but it's 11 to 56 with a plain G string, although it's a pretty thick G, so like, but, but there's, there is quite a bit of resistance to bending. Yeah. Um, and I really love those, and and I you know I have a ton of those in my studio too. And so like when someone comes in with a bass that needs strings, it's like here we go in my XLs. And um, I really love all their products. I'm using the yellow, the yellow picks. Um, these are great, um, and also the Dario cables. This one might be Planet Ways branded. I think they Which they kind of wrapped up the yeah, Planet Ways family. branding, but um, but yeah, I really like the Dario stuff. So. And uh, Sorry to cut you off, Kurt, but I know we have a limited time. Is I, I want to get your ear as a guy that's, you know, you're designing GCI, uh, like pedals that you guys have done, the business cards that you used to carry around, obviously yeah. instruments now. What have you learned specifically to instrument design and building since you've started this l venture years and years ago? I think it's really interesting when you are, when you're, when you're just a musician, you're playing in your own band, you're kind of, you're a bit of an island. Like you, you can have a finely curated taste that is only yours. Mm -hmm. 
when you sort of open things up, as I have, like as a recording engineer, as I've worked with other artists over the years on their recordings, and all, then later as a, an instrument um, and pedal designer, it's, it's forced me to broaden my taste, and I think it's been a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've, I've learned that like the ideas that I had when I was younger about guitar and what good guitar sounds were, were, were really narrow and were very specific to me, and I still do appreciate that stuff, but as I've progressed, as a uh, engineer, producer, and instrument designer, like my my tastes have broadened, and I can be I can be more malleable and create tools that or and create sounds in my studio that are that are specific to other people's ideas as well. Do you feel that having the relationship of guitarist, you know, songwriter, someone that's creating within a band, but then also as a producer and a sound engineer, and then an instrument designer, that all plays together to almost diversify what Converge has evolved into through the run of the band? Yeah, I mean, it's tough to quantify what that is, but I, I look at all creation as just different sides of the same coin. So whether I'm writing a song or recording a song or working with my band or working with another band, it's all part of the creative process and it all sort of helps me get my fix of what I'm looking for as a person. Mm. Well, before we go on to some other evolutions that have happened here at your feet and uh, behind myself here, we should uh, give some time to this beautiful. Oh instrument. yeah, this is the uh, this is the GCI Craftsman. You know, we were talking about D'Addario earlier. We've got the D'Addario elliptical straps. I stopped using strap locks a while ago. Once I started using the D'Addario elliptical strap buttons, um, this one is a um, this is called the Craftsman. This is also 25 and a half scale, inch and 11 sixteenths wide nut. Uh, but this one's a ch uh, a chambered mahogany body with a Wenge top. The um, I'm using D'Addario uh, auto trim tuners on this one, but on this guitar it has a, a high quality, lightweight, open back tuner so that there's not excessive neck dive uh, due to the chambered body. Um, and then we've got a uh, GraphTech compensator bridge on this one. I really like the GraphTech stuff. Um, does, doesn't break a lot of strings on the saddles and they've got nice smooth um, studs here for the bridge mounting so it doesn't chew up my hand as I'm palm muting. Um, so this is a you know beautiful guitar that is kind of I, I love to play this thing. This is my favorite, just sort of basic rock and roll machine, and I use it for most of uh, most of Converge uh, writing and recording now. Now I recall from the last time that we spoke in 2021 over the internet, you were using a Craftsman similar to this one. I think it had like a natural top, but it was a spruce top, yeah. chambered body. What was the experiment there? Because when I associate spruce tops or spruce, I'm almost thinking automatically acoustic guitars. Yeah, well, uh, that was a bit of an experiment, A, because I just had never seen a spruce top electric. Yeah. And I know, I mean, they do exist, but like, I, it's not something I had encountered in person. Mm -hmm. And I was just sort of curious about what it would sound like. And a lot of like the different specs that I've done on guitars over the years and colorways, et cetera, have just been experiments where like, what would this look like with that? And they'll do a small run of them, and if I like it, I'll continue. And the spruce top, I think, wasn't a successful experiment. It had a little more sparkle than the Wenge top. Um, and it looked a little more like the um, the Malcolm Young Gretsch yeah. that I was partially inspired by. You know, the inspiration of this thing comes from a lot of things, but you know, obviously like Gretsch, Malcolm Young stuff, the Gretsch Steam Liner, Dan Electro stuff, First Act stuff, all the sort Sheena, of. The Sheena, and I always think yeah. of the Rickenbacker that you played two, three years too. That I think maybe more in the headstock, headstock. in the, in this shape, um, but but yeah, you know, like classic classic American stuff. Your history with Converge has certainly provided like R and D for for yeah, this stuff. Totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. Field tested. Should we move on to uh, what You're kind of stand. has happened down to your feet here? Yeah. Yeah. Let's Ooh. do it. Cool. So. So yeah, on this tour and for the past um, bunch of years, um, I've been touring with a Line Six Helix as my primary um, everything really. Um, I have for for a couple of reasons. For one. We almost never get a chance to play shows on our own gear anymore. Hmm. So having a, and, and, you know, and baggage restrictions on airlines are tighter and tighter all the time. So having a ultra portable thing that is a consistent sound every night and you know compact and portable has been really helpful. Also, um, I, I play a stereo rig and so using like microphones on stage, we tend to play a lot of like bouncy stages and things get pretty physical and yeah. cabs get bumped into. So the 
phase relationship between two microphones on two cabinets would potentially always be changing on a bouncy stage or, you know, like a cab's getting pushed around or something. So this is provides a super phase stable relationship between the left and right channels. And it's also sounds really good. Did you do um, any testing to the market or did you kind of just get into the modeling through the line well, six nets where it's kind of ended so far? One of the things that I've, I mean, I've, I've, I mean, I've played with Kemper and mm. fractal stuff and other, you know, plugins. I do have like a, a pack with STL tones. That's, that's really cool. Um, but the thing that I really love about Helix is the way that it scales across a whole product line. So where I started with Helix was Helix native. So it's uh, just a DAW plugin that mm -hmm. allows you to do everything you can do in Helix. And it limits you in terms of um, how much, how many blocks of sounds you can have within Helix native. So you could never build a preset in native that the floor unit wouldn't be able to handle. Um, so I, you know, I started by building sounds there, really loved that stuff, and then was able to get this, this floor unit. I since um, turned on a whole bunch of friends to it. I also have a, um, a Stomp XL um, as my backup rig. That's a little okay. bit more limited than this, but and I can, I can do pretty much everything I need to do with that, but I like having the, the larger size of this because I have size 14 or 15 <laughs> shoes. So like the bigger, the bigger floor unit w works out really well. And this still allows me to fly anywhere and have, you know, a consistent sound night after night. The, the feed to front of house is the same no matter what I'm using for stage power um, or no matter where in the world. You know, it also accepts any incoming voltage from like 100 volts all the way to 240 volts. Like, and it's built like a tank. So it's just super reliable and I love it. How do you have it set up? Is it set up? Uh, patch base almost like a, a stomp box or a pedal board where you have five or six key sounds or are you changing with that or throughout the set automatically with this because I've seen it so, set up so many different ways yeah so there's basically three um, there's basically three modes you can do with helix you can do a presets mode snapshots mode or stomp boxes mode mm -hmm. so in um, the, the blood moon version of converge we use um, uh, snapshots mode so we have a different preset for each song and then within that song we have buttons that say like verse chorus pre-chorus etc and it will do all of the the effects changing as well as turn knobs on an amp that needs to happen wow. um, built into that and then also so Steve and I both use those in Blood Moon so all of like the, the mix settings are kind of all baked into that so like tanning like if Steve's taking a solo, I'll be like pseudo doubled in the left channels and set down a little bit while he's louder. And mm -hmm. then like, and then we're playing companion parts. Like I'm panned left, he's panned right. We're 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 mixed evenly. Like he's doing acoustic simulator in the in the middle. I might have like one guitar on the left and then a harmony of that guitar on the right. There's really like all sorts of mix type things you can do. And also like the BPMs are all like you know slaved to our like backing tracks for that. So that's like. That's the most elaborate that I've gotten into, like stage production, mm -hmm. and I love the, the the fact that we get to do something like that that requires a lot of forethought and setup um, in getting ready for a tour. But then at the same time, too, I love that I'm doing you know a throw and go situation with this, where with Converge Classic as we call it now, <laughs> just uses. Um, uh, stomp boxes mode. Okay. So I only have one preset for Converge. It's the Kurt preset version six and this thing is um a full a full stereo rig so let me let me walk you through this yeah. um so we have the input we've got um the auto auto impedance detection so the, the highest impedance uh seems to work best for my guitars um there is a, a very light gate built into that um followed by a fuzz that i'm not really using on this tour and then I actually have two gates, so I have a gate here, followed by a um, like centaur style distortion, mm -hmm. and then another gate. The gates are switched. Oh wait, they're not. I, I, oh, that explains why I have feedback problems. I gotta <laughs> fix that. So these two gates are supposed to switch together. Oh. Um, What's the idea behind that? Just almost like. So this the the gate before the distortion. You have the full dynamic range of the guitar, mm -hmm. um, causing the gate the the key of the gate to open. And then the gate after the distortion, you know, the dynamic range of the signal is much smaller after distortion. Um, so that gate is 
inherently less sensitive. So basically the gate before stops feedback from happening, the gate after uh, kills the noise. Um, so I'm gonna have to fix that after our rig rundown. Um, <laughs> followed by a pitch effect. So I used to use uh, Boss PS3 for this pitch effect. It's an octave up and octave down. I use that on sections like the, um, the chorus of uh, Reap What You Sow, the intro to the conversion song Plagues, and the thing that's unique about this octave up and down is it, it mimics what the, the Boss PS3 does, where the octaves are subtly delayed. I think just probably due to the nature of that like early 90s DSP technology, they, they had quite a bit of latency. So I have latency in the, uh, in, built into these octaves. So like if you like chug with that setting, well, here, let me just chug yeah. with that setting. <laughs> It's kind of got a bit of an offset, mm -hmm. um, and it, it's a it's a thickener. Now, did you get that idea from Steven? Because I know that he kind of does the the up and down with the PS stuff. Steve uses the PS3 on a different mode than me. Okay. His is the glissando mode, where yeah. it, it like goes like. It almost sounds like a, like um, a Floyd getting. Yeah, um, and mine mine is is like fixed octave up, oh, okay. octave down. Um, yeah, then we've got. Ping pong, which turns on delay, a stereo delay and stereo reverb at the same time. Can we hear that? Sure. Just in the stereo? Yeah. Since we have the stereo. And, uh, oh, and I, because I only use one preset, um, for the, our whole set, I just have the delay set to, to tap. So I should have tapped that first. I have the, the ping pong uh, reverb, which is being switched together next to the pitch mode so that I can do those at the same Double time stomp. when I do it properly. Um, um, that's a little lick that I use for that one. Um, followed by See, I got searchlights as if I need to do any like space rock stuff. I don't do that um, in this set at all. All right, so here's where I think where I get to the, the stuff about Helix that I really, really like is in this um, the second and third row of blocks. Okay. So now we move down to the next row, and I have we'll come back to this stuff over here, um, this loop stuff. So I've got two different amp models. I'm using like um, like a diesel on the left side and a um, an Archon on the right side. Those are just amp blocks and not there's no IRs as part of those blocks. Mm -hmm. So then it goes to uh, so quarter inch sends. So now we've got amp sim but no IR that goes out quarter inch send to amps on stage the the power amp in of these quilters over here. I'm using the quilter. Overdrive 202s. For some reason, there's something like you, interesting about how the effects loops are wired in these that you have to dummy plug the effects in to get the full strength of the power amp. Huh. Um, and it's like a thing that is just inherent in the design that Quilter knows about. Um, the Overdrive 200 wasn't like that. I'm not sure why they changed the design, but for some reason they did. Um, but these things are totally bulletproof. You know, again, like I can take these anywhere in the world, put any voltage into them. I can. I've played shows with these at noon on a 100 degree day in Austin, Texas with the sun beating directly down on top of them and they didn't miss a beat. Like they're indestructible and they sound great. And if my Helix went down, I'd be totally happy plugging into the input of one of these things and getting my sound that way because the preamps sound great too. Or like as we're talking before off camera, uh, the Daytona 500 too, you know, in the yeah. sun. You yeah, know? yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it, they don't care. Like they're just, they're basically indestructible um, and extremely portable, so. Fit in a gig bag? Yeah, I love that. Um, and a bit of a tangent here but um another thing about the whole like quilter and helix thing for me is i've been both in my converge life and my recording studio life is I'm, I'm trying to get to a point where gear doesn't matter like i love gear i have a ton of gear i've got a ton of vintage amps a ton of cool microphones you just put my like, job on the line or our yeah. jobs on the <laughs> well a ton of i have a ton of cool like stuff but I like in it I love it and it does matter when it matters but I also think that you know tone comes from fingers and and 
Um, I don't I don't like the idea of like musical gatekeeping that like you can't do something because you don't have a piece of gear. Yeah. So like the idea that like we can come up here and use some like like boring modern gear and still have a killer show that connects with people is like really exciting to me that I don't have to have like I don't have to bring my V4. And it's not so much a convenience thing, I mean it is a convenience thing, but like it's also just like I think it's empowering to people that can't afford or can't find all this crazy vintage gear that yeah. you don't actually need all that stuff. As long as you have ears, patience, and drive to find something cool, you can do something cool with anything. I mean, you think about when you started your band way back when, it's like it was just the idea of being in a band with a bunch of friends. Yeah. It wasn't about, oh, I gotta have the clon. And any of your favorite records that have some amazing sound on them, the reason why they have that amazing sound is because that was creative people using what they had at their disposal yeah. and making the most of whatever they had at their disposal. It's not because those people are like, oh, fuck, we've got to get a whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, or otherwise this record's ruined, um, you know. Uh, so anyway, a little side note, but um, you know, so I, I'm not using full range um, cabinets on stage because it's more common to find um, guitar speaker cabinet, so I don't want the I don't want an IR going to my speaker cabinet. I want a pre R signal IR signal going to my speaker cabinet. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have these nice Bad Cat cabs and these Quilter amps, and we flew to a backline thing, you know, I can plug into the effects return of any like dual rectifier or whatever they happen to have at the festival, and I'll be fine for stage volume. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just so happens that this stuff sounds really nice, and I'm <laughs> happy to have it on stage with me. And these these bad cat cabs are super cool too. Is there anything special we should know about uh, speakers that you've selected, they, or are ones, they stock? These ones are just the stock um, V30s, which okay. which I like a lot. I think my favorite guitar speaker is usually um, Celestia and Classic Lead 80. Hmm. Um, but V30s are great. I'm not really a greenback guy, but I, I do love V30s. These cab. I feel like cabinets sound. Cabinets maybe have a sound more than speakers a yeah. lot of times. And these Why do you cabinets think that is? Really good. Just out of the construction and the, the wood? Construction, wood, d dimensions. How it pushes the air? Like open back and, I mean, uh, front loaded and back loaded sound different. Um, I don't know. It's a really hard thing to A-B. Yeah. You know, like when you want to like A-B, like a speaker change or a cabinet change, like because mic position is so important and it takes time to like swap those things, it's a really difficult thing to like get a, an apples to apples comparison of. So mm -hmm. it's, you're doing it like, you know, just by feel a lot. Um, but I don't know, these feel good. Whenever I'm getting a sound in my studio, I just like line up a whole bunch of cabs and we just pick the one that sounds good. Mm -hmm. But then you're swayed by, you're like, you know, you plug in a guitar amp into a cabinet, you dial in all the knobs, now you've dialed it for that cabinet, and then you plug in a different cabinet. A whole different. You gotta redial it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then so it's hard, it's to that, even that is hard to AB. Or even different pickups, you know, like yeah. our guitar. It's so many different variables to try to pin down, oh, that's the thing that gave me the 10% extra. Right, and that's why, you know, you just, you make the most of, of with whatever you have at your disposal. Well, is there anything else that we should talk about inside the uh, Line 6 Helix? Yeah, well, not, yeah, so I didn't quite reach the end yet. Okay. So, yeah, we've got the, um, we've got these quarter inch sends that go to the quilters, um, f followed by, some IRs that I've kind of cooked up uh, on my own that are not actually ones that I created for in my studio, but um, existing IRs that I've like tweaked, tweaked mm -hmm. um, to my to my liking. Um, channel two. So let me let me just show you the whole channel two path here. So this is my this is my right side. So this is the the side that gets panned to Nate's side. I've got a few things. I've got a mute switch um, and a looper. So the, the looper is like a, a phrase sampler type of type of looper. And it's uh, this is like their, their one button mode. So when I go to, well, let me, let me show you a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got this song that we're playing on this tour called I Have a Quarrel. And it starts out with me playing a little guitar lick. I start looping it. And then I, jo then I overdub. Uh, me playing another part over the loop. Mm -hmm. And so when I start the overdub, I hit the mute switch. So now I'm muting the signal going into the looper uh, um, so that the channel two is playing only the loop and channel one is playing only what I'm doing live. So that goes like. <laughs> Now, are you doing a lot 
lot throughout the set, or is that just specific to that song? Because I know no. you guys have toured with two guitar players before, so like it's this been a is, while. Yeah, so I don't know if that was kind of making up for the two guitar. I don't do a lot of that. I'm not very good at looping. I screw it up a lot. Um, <laughs> Leave that to, to Mike from Russian Circles. <laughs> well, like I'm I'm fine with like. I only have a couple of pet peeves about Helix, and they're both about the looper. Let's air, so, um, let's air the grievances. Oh, let's air the grievances. So they have the, they have basically three loop loopers. They've got the one switch looper, which sort of functions like a ditto, where where you've got like multi tap gestures in order to make it do the different functions. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time with those multi tap gestures. That's what I always fuck up. Um, they have like a glitch looper that I don't really use, but it sounds neat. And then there's a six button looper, um, which but when you go to the six button looper, it opens a whole new page. And I wouldn't be able to have this mute switch available right on the there. same page as the six button looper. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to me. What I wish is that they had a simple two button looper. Like, like I used to use an, uh, I used to use an Akai head rush. That was really easy. It was yeah. just like record, play, stop. You know, it's, it's, it's super simple. It's pretty, it's pretty idiot proof. And like, when you, when you have a set that's like pretty like athletic, like a converge set can mm -hmm. be, like you need stuff that is, Idiot proof. That's a really um, good adjective for, for your guy. <laughs> yeah. Set. Um, and uh, so that was the first one with the looper. What's the second grievance? Oh, my, my second grievance is that um, turning on the tuner mutes the output of the helix rather than mutes the input. So, oh. like, I would like to be able to make noise between songs, oh. may, have a loop running, and then you know turn on the tuner and tune, and then let I mean, do its obviously, thing. I, I could wire up an out. An out an external tuner. Yeah. Um, I can do, a, I mean, it has a whole bunch of loops too if I want to do more like external pedals, but I'm, I like the portability of just having one unit and not having to plug anything else in. It's like that's, the thing can go to the moon, but it can't go down to Kroger. It's like, it's like that, <laughs> that task seems simple enough because it's doing so much else. You know, and I've talked with them about that and there's just something in the way it was designed that it seems like that's not possible. Huh. Um, which is, and that, so that bums me out, but I'm, but I'm used to it. Um, yeah. It's probably better to give people a little rest for their ears between songs anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the auditory assault that you guys provide. Yeah. So, oh, and then one other thing on ch channel two is um, I've got another another pitch block over here, which is uh, just a simple pitch, uh, subtle delay and detune. So eight cents flat and 14 milliseconds delayed for channel two. That's always on. And that is, um, so that provides like a, a stereo widening. That's not a chorus, so it's not modulating. It's just like, it's a stereo widener. Mm -hmm. And that happens only, I feel like that stuff, when you hear it in mono, like two cabs right next to each other on a stage, sounds a little bit weird and chorusy, but spread out in a, a venue's PA system, it makes things nice and wide and opens up a hole in the center channel for everybody else to live in. Uh -huh. Otherwise there'd be, even though I'm using two different amp models and two different IRs, there still would be a very strong phantom center channel coming from the guitar signal. Yeah. And basically, you know, kick, snare, bass, vocals, all that stuff's coming from the center channel. So there's a lot of competition in the center channel. Um, and if I can get myself away from that and open up space for everybody else, the, the mix can be louder and clearer. Now, the last thing I got for you, Kurt, before we move on to Nate's setup is, are you running in-ears at all? Or are you doing stage just, volume? Just, just stage volume and wedges. Um, yeah, not for this tour, but we've done ears for the Blood Moon version of Converge because there's like this click track for that. Yeah. And uh, is there anything specific that you ask front of house for your wedges or just kind of a little bit of everybody? No, um, no, we just, we basically want to hear ourselves and and drums. Um, we, we and monitors that are too quiet are generally better than monitors that are too loud. Mm. Um, and just, yeah, pretty, pretty simple mixes. We don't want to hear too much of the other people. Um, we're not necessarily looking for it to sound good. We're just trying to uh, know what we're doing. Same yeah. with lights. Like, you know, like cool lighting shows are awesome, but like if I can't see what notes I'm playing, I'm going to play like shit. Yeah. Like, um, so we are, I think our, our monitor mixes are, and our light shows tend to be kind of functional, boring, yeah. ut utilitarian. To allow you guys to shine on stage. Yeah. Well, well Kurt, uh, I appreciate your time and uh, I think we're going to move on to Nate's setup. No problem. Thanks. I appreciate you coming. Hell yeah. Hey everyone, now I'm on the other side of the stage with Converge bassist Nate. Nate, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? Real good, man. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. I know we got to get a lot of bands up here on stage and get ready, but uh, we have to talk about your bass gear. So tell me about this uh, awesome Fender. Um, it's a Fender. <laughs> it's a precision bass that Fender gave me 
that's pretty much it. Really? It's a, it's a precision bass, and I like it. Uh, it Pickup cell, those are special. Yeah, it's got my uh, signature um, lace Rift Blaster pickups in it, and they're cool, man. I like them. They're... Cool. What kind of feed, what kind of feedback did you give Lace when you're like, hey, I, I want to pick up um, that either does this or doesn't do this or? Well, th they sent me a few to try out, mm -hmm. um, and they were all cool, but none of them quite got exactly where I wanted to be. Like you they, came from EMGs or Actas. I, I did, and they like I was just so tired of like, I mean, if you've seen Converge play, you, yeah, I don't treat instruments well, no, or my body, but um, like just constantly throwing my shit around and whatever it would always rattle everything loose mm. and like the battery cables or the battery housing would start coming loose and like i'd be playing and it would cut out and it, mostly it's just because i'm a i'm an idiot that doesn't know how to take care of anything that i own but um well, this looks in pretty good shape this is yeah so far i, I cleaned all the blood most of the blood off of it for no there's still some blood on it uh, but there's some DNA in there. Yeah, there's a lot of DNA on there. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I was just like, I want something that sounds as hot as an active pickup, but doesn't. Uh, it, it's is idiot proof. <laughs> there you go. Because I'm an idiot, and um, yeah, that's kind of it. It's not quite as hot as as uh, as the EMGs were that I was using, which I think has worked out a lot better for me. Um, yeah, it. Uh, they're just super punchy and fun to play. Was there one? Or was there something that took you down one path when it came either the P bass or the J bass in terms of kind of lining yourself up with one instrument or the other? Yeah, the first P bass that I bought was cheaper. <laughs> really? That's it. Yeah. That's just, that's literally. I'm not precious about yeah. stuff. Like the P bass was. I, my first P bass was a uh, an eighty one. Uh, P bass special um, that we bought two days before the first Converge tour I went on because I didn't own a bass and they needed me to fill in and uh, so I came up to Massachusetts. I lived in Virginia and I came up to Massachusetts and they were like, "Where's your bass?" And I was like, "I don't have a bass." <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a slight requirement. Yeah, and then so we got a bass and then they were like, "All right." What songs do you want to play? I'm like, I don't know how to play any of your songs. <laughs> Steep learning curve. Yeah, and then then uh, I learned some parts of the songs, and then we went on tour. <laughs> Figured out the rest in the run. Uh, no. No? No, I just kept going. Man, I love that. Just jumped around and made it. I was really... Um, I figured if I just looked like I was really into it, people wouldn't notice it. <laughs> and... And look at the career you forged with that much attitude. Still exactly where I am. <laughs> well, what about strings? I know that Kurt was he was really uh, loyal to Diodario, NYXLs. Is that kind of where you live too? I'm an Ernie Ball guy. Oh man, that's got to start some fights. No, <laughs> I, don't. I don't care what he does over there. Yeah. It doesn't matter to me. No, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't <laughs> see why that would be a problem to begin with, especially with someone like such a nice, carefree, laid back attitude as yourself. Yeah. Fuck that shit. I mean, it's fine. Do whatever. Uh, you do have a second P bass. Uh, is there a reason that gets brought along? Is that like a safety net, or is that alternate tunings that you're not using um, with this one? I usually just bring it as a safety. Um, with the alternate tunings and Converge, for me, it's usually just like... The top string. Done. Uh, um, so it's not a really big deal. Like, I'm usually done tuning before Kurt has switched guitars. Yeah. Um, and even on some of the tuning changes, it's only him that needs to change, not me, because he'll he does like some higher string stuff that doesn't affect me at all. Um, and then even on some of the tunings, I just learned it in the wrong tuning, and that's how I play it, uh, and that's how I recorded it. So because it just seemed like too much of a pain in the ass to tune down again. Yeah, because you know, forge ahead. That, yeah, that's the Nate Newton method. Yeah, straight ahead. Just who cares. <laughs> Is the Nate Newton Nate New this Nate Newton method? Um, so, in on this tour in particular, though, this tour ends and I have a day to get from Columbus, Ohio, to Denver to start the cave-in um, 
Yob Tour. Which is exciting. Yeah, I'm excited about it. It's going to be a fun one. So I brought... Knowing that, your gear, I'm sure, doesn't change. Like, these will be the two bases that goes out with yeah. Steven um, and the I boys. Kinda, like, generally speaking, I have a different amp setup with cave -in, but that's not necessarily because of tone or anything like that. That's pretty much specifically just out of convenience because most of this stuff lives at God City mm -hmm. because that's where Converge rehearses and um, Caven has a rehearsal space so I have another rig there. And that's usually the quilter uh, bass block and um, a boogie like 80s road ready 215. Okay. Um, and that, that thing with the 215 fucking that it, it's a beast it's loud as fuck and the 8200 you've i've seen you have that for years yeah i've had i don't even know how long i've had that now like it's got to be 15 or so years um and i mean that's kind of just become my mainstay um i tr i've tried a lot of other amps i was gonna say I, why what's what's stuck with you on this one this um, partnership i think for me personally like you know, I know so many people that swear by, by Ampeg bass amps, and they're great amps, but um, I have a really hard time with the mid-range on Ampeg bass, uh, bass amps. I, huh. I don't know why. Like, like SVTs in particular have this kind of honky upper mid-range that I'm not talented enough to uh, use. This just doesn't have that. And, um, like, with a pedal in front of it, it just cuts really well. and still has a really good bottom end um yeah so how's the the quilters running i, I said there's a di box behind us so that's going out to front of house is the quilter oh or th no this is just up here as a backup okay right now um so, so the 8200 is the working the 8200 is going to a radial uh like a jdx okay and um, that's going front of house that goes to front of house in place of using a microphone mm -hmm. um and then from my board, uh, we've got, I've got this shift line cab zone, which is like an IR, um, uh, you know, amp and cab simulator. And it's got, I don't know, like 10 different preamps and 10 different uh, cab sims on it. And so uh, you, we'll, we'll run both of these out to front of house and then um, our front of house guy can blend kind of in. blend them together to make it sound like there's more than one amp up here. Because I used to travel with multiple amps, and carrying shit is stupid. <laughs> you get no argument from me. Yeah. Can we hear your bass tone, and then we can incorporate these uh, these two pedals you have down here? Yeah, sure, man. I mean, it's it's not very exciting. <laughs> there you go. That's what we got. It sounds like a bass. Maybe I should change those strings. They're getting a little, a little flat. But I mean, there's, yeah, not much to it. Just everything pretty much right in the middle. Gain just, just past the middle. Um, this is not where my stage volume usually is. I'm usually up around between four and five, depending, mm -hmm. depending on the room. Sometimes it's that's oppressively loud, but yeah. and sometimes it's not loud enough. Um, but yeah, just pretty much right in the middle. And then, then I put this bad boy on the uh, the Nunez Tetrafet drive, which is and that pushes that amp. Yeah, I love this pedal. It's uh, I think John designed it as as a guitar pedal, but I I tried it out and was like, fuck, that's the one. But yeah, it's just. It's like the 200 has its personality still there, but it, it feels like it just got cut off in traffic and it's got like road rage now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. There's a whole different personality. Yeah. It like, I don't generally like bass distortion pedals. Like they always, they always seem to be missing some kind of grit or like that, that high end, like sound like a dimed out tube amp kind of mm -hmm. tone. It's, it's just never there. It's always just like, I don't know. It just, to me they always just sound like fuzz and they they don't have like the attack that i want or, or at least most of the ones i've tried 
and you know or they'll have like a clean blend to try and get a little bit of that attack but every time i try and use a clean blend i just just sounds terrible to me yeah i don't know why and you know i don't like clean blends now do you push that like is the pedal on the drive pedal on would you say percentage of the set 50 uh in converge it's always on so it's an always on yeah cave in um 95 percent of the time it's on there's a couple of clean clean spots but uh yeah, that's pretty much my always on pedal. And, and then the rubber neck? The rubber neck is just a weird delay that it is it if you turn a knob too far it gets away from you and it's really hard to control. But um yeah, that's just like, you know, I I rarely use it in converge. It's mostly for making noise between songs, but um, I use it a lot more in Cave-In than I do in Converge. So that's what I was going to ask. Not, not anything like song or real-world application for Converge, more of a, a bridge in between moments yeah, or songs? Yeah, in, in Cave-In there's some stuff where I like have to tap tempo and um, you know use the delay as part of the song, but um, in Converge it's mostly like you're tuning, you're drinking water okay and it's just dead silence up here so i'm just gonna make some horrible noises for a little while until you count off the next song can i dare you to make some horrible noises and get on the bull sure see where it takes us uh just next song Boom. you know so it's kurt hates it and the, and the mini <laughs> the little mini crybaby wall is that as kind of a an extension of the rubber knock or does that have actual application within the band uh in converge not so much in cave in i do use it uh quite a bit actually um uh yeah um on the upcoming cave in tour there's two or three songs in the set where I, I use it pretty pretty extensively. Um, you know, it's just a it's just a bass wah. Sounds yeah. like a bass wah, you know. I can Is it ever any cuz I've never messed with the small one, you know, having a, a normal size foot. Is yeah. that is it weird? You know what I mean like cuz I've never interacted honestly, with the little baby. Honestly, I've kind of gotten used to it and prefer it to the big one. Huh. Um, it's just a matter of fi like finding where you need to put your foot on it. That's about it, but it's just right there you know and, and like making sure you're not right there so you step on the tuner which i've yeah. done numerous times like i just did literally wow yeah yeah i know i clunkified that question but it was mainly seriousness because of how subtle a throw of a wah pedal or an expression pedal is kind of unique or expressive to someone's playing and sound yeah so i didn't know if that the little guy kind of threw you off but apparently no, you prefer it yeah it's uh, honestly it's i've gotten so used to it that i try and play a bigger one now i'm like ah just go why why <laughs> fuck <laughs> like why is it so hard um yeah there you go <laughs> well nate we just met but i feel like we're kindred spirits uh i'll let you go on your journey you're about to go on and i appreciate your time <laughs> Everyone, no Albert, worries. stay safe and uh, oh, check out Converge. Oh, you want to see the other bass, by the way? Do I? Uh, you tell me. That's the cave-in bass. Yes, let's do that real quick. Okay. So and then this... we can say goodbye to these kind folks. Yeah, here, let me do this. I also, uh, I never bring a stand on tour. I saw that when we pulled up. I just do that. I bit that from CJ Ramon. Um, so this is Caleb's bass. Caleb Schofield's bass. Oh, that's From cave-in. And yeah. so this always tours with cave-in um that's awesome and this fucking bass is great like i it really is the best playing p bass i've ever played i love this thing it's also got my pickups in it um and yeah i don't know so if cave-in's on the road this comes with me always um i've got two other p bases that the tour with me as well and it's always just kind of matter of, a matter of picking them up and being like, whoa, that one needs some work. Put that one back. <laughs> this one will work. Okay, let's go. Um, but yeah, this one is, 
it always comes. That's cool, so. and I'm sure the guys in Cavelin, Caven, and the fans appreciate you continuing Caleb's uh, legacy by playing the instrument on it, tour. It feels good. You know, it's um, it's a weird thing. It feels almost, especially playing the older songs and playing yeah. this bass um, in a weird way. It kind of feels like hanging out with Caleb. You know, it feels like he's there with us. So, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's an honor to have this instrument, and uh, yeah. I cherish it. This song is called Axe to Fall. 